Hello friends and welcome to episode 49 of Little Big Knits. This is a podcast about knitting primarily. I'm your host, my name is Selma and you can find me on Instagram and Ravelry as Selma Knits. Um, I am located here in Ottawa where I live with my my family and our cat Yoda who's on the sofa over there sleeping. Let's see. Let's see if she makes an appearance. That hasn't happened in a while. <laughs> Welcome today. Welcome to those of you who've been around for a long time and those of you who've joined recently. Uh, there have been quite a few of you, so hello. Welcome. I hope you continue to enjoy what I am sharing of my knitting journey with you. So hello. Today, I am, of course, going to share with you uh, my finished objects, my works in progress. As promised, I'm going to do an old sock review. That doesn't sound very pleasant in a way, does it? But yet I know that there are some of you that are excited about this. <laughs> somebody actually said, I can't believe I'm excited to see somebody's old socks. Um, and I thought, yes, this is a little strange, isn't it? But anyway, I thought I'd share that with you later to talk a little bit about... Um, uh, you know, the, the, the yarns that I've used that have lasted, that have, haven't lasted, that, um, you know, some of the mistakes I've made in sock knitting that I've learned over the, over the years. So I'll share that with you a little bit later. I also wanted to talk about, I think, having a new knit along that I'll talk about soon. And, uh, and then some of the beautiful things that have come into my life. So that's what's in store for today. And hello, this is future Selma, Selma of the evening, Selma who is editing the podcast. I'm just telling you this is going to be a longie. And before we get on to uh, the rest of the business, just a reminder that we have a knit along going on at the moment as well called the Color Play Cal. And it is being hosted in the Ravelry group that we have, Little Big Knits. However, please feel free to use the hashtag ColorPlayCal on Instagram as well to share uh, there as well. So um, that is going until the 1st of July. There's been a lot of color work over the last few months. Uh, we started on December 24th. You can join in at this time. If you started your project after December 24th, it is eligible. If you want to uh, put it into the finished object thread, there's also a chatter thread where you can come in and chat. My life has been a little bit crazy for the last couple of weeks, so I usually participate in the chat, but I just have not been able to. But I can see the number of posts increasing, so clearly people are. Please keep chatting. Um, I know that there have been connections made through those groups, so uh, or through those threads, so that's really, really lovely. And, uh, and it's so wonderful to see the FO threads that I definitely still look at. Um, but I have been, uh, it's been a little bit of a crazy week, uh, la no, two and a half weeks for me, um, with just my mother's health not being great. And she's been in the hospital and in re now in rehab. So it's just been taking up a lot of my attention with conversations with people at the hospitals and, at the retirement home and trying to figure out uh, where we're going to go from here with my mom, depending on how she does at rehab. It's just been, it's been very busy. So although I've been knitting um, and participating in, in some conversations, I haven't been able to do uh, everything. So I, I opted not to try and keep up with the conversation thread. So today I am drinking my tea out of a very special mug. I am about to show you a very special mug that somebody has made for me. Is this beautiful or what? I am so in love with this mug. This mug was made for me by a woman who's got a company name, Knit Swag. And she makes custom mugs as well as other things. She's also got some knitting graph paper. Um, and, uh, she has made this beautiful mug for me. And I just, I'm just, I was so impressed with it when it arrived. I just couldn't believe how Selma it is. Uh, it's reminiscent of the, um, Silver Forest sweater that I made earlier in the winter. Um, although not, not the same design, but, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm so in love with this mug. 
Um, of course, my family said, Mom, you've got so many mugs already. But this is a special mug. So, and in it, I've got my uh, sea buckthorn tea that I had last time as well, Turnite, which I really, really like. So, Knit Swag, I've put the name down here, is offering you guys a 15% discount should you be interested in getting yourself your own mug. She's got lots of different designs. Of course, you could choose this design if you want, um, but she's also got lots of other designs. Uh, very, very apropos for our color play cal. They're mostly sort of color play types of, of designs. So she is giving us a 15% discount until May 16th. And the code to be used for this is Selma Knits. So I'll put that across the screen here. 15% off at Knit Swag. If you feel like going to check it out. Um, yeah, I just, I really like the feel of this mug. And I'm just, it's really exciting to have a color work mug. I love it. So thank you so much, Knit Swag. Super, super fun. So um, yeah, so that's what I am drinking today out of a absolutely fabulous mug. And next episode is episode 50. So I thought uh, that we should perhaps have a, a bit of a question and answer. Now, I probably won't do a whole episode of question and answer just because I find, I find when I watch question and answer episodes, I find that they can tend to be a little bit on the long side um, for me anyway. Uh, but I thought I would um, at least do a portion of question and answer perhaps over the next couple of episodes, answering some of the themes in there and then and at the end of the episode. And that way, if people are interested, they can stick around. So if you have some questions that you would like to ask me, uh, whether it is about knitting the podcast. I'm happy to answer uh, questions about our personal life as well, um, about me, if there's something that you happen to be uh, curious about. Uh, feel free to post those questions below and uh, I'll sort of uh, collect them and then answer them as we go along over the next uh, two or three episodes. And uh, yeah, celebrating episode 50 next time. I have been podcasting by myself. I think this in June, it'll be four years. Um, and before that, I was uh, an occasional podcaster on the Two Tangled Skeins. So it does feel like I've been doing this a long time, even though I've only got to episode 50. I only podcast about once a month. So I guess it's been about 50 months or so that I've been podcasting. So it's been such a wonderful part of my life. I enjoy it so much. And even if sometimes life can be a little bit crazy as it has been recently, uh, actually podcasting is like a little ray of sunshine uh, that I do here and there. So I just really enjoy doing it. And I'm so grateful for those of you that love to come and spend some time with me. It's, uh, it's really, really, really fun. So yeah, so that will be for next time. All right, I am going to start with the sweater that I was knitting on last time, which was a test knit for Sari Nordland. It has since been published. I think it was published this week, Thursday or Friday. And um, it is called the Lumme Sweater. And I have finished this beauty. I have to say that this is probably one of the most striking two color yokes I've ever seen. I just, I just, I fell in love with it immediately and I'm going to be making a second one. So let me tell you first a little bit about this sweater. This is a worsted weight color work. Uh, Sari's um, version is made in Cascade and I happen to have some Cascade in my life, which was why one of the reasons why I wanted to test knit this because I thought I don't even need to buy yarn. I've got it there. Um, and uh, I just, as I said, the yoke on this is so incredibly beautiful. There is also color work on the sleeve and it was really, really fun to knit. So here it is. It's got a bit of short row shaping at the bottom, which I did. Um, now, this sweater has ended up actually a little bit big for me. Um, and I have a friend who I think 
may look quite nice in this and she's open to trying it on and taking it on. So I may be giving this to her and making myself another one. And, um, but because I really, really love it, I certainly wouldn't want to not have this sweater in my life because I think it's just going to be, it's, it's just so darn beautiful. Um, I can't get over the, the gorgeousness of this of this yoke design and, and the sleeve design as well. There's so many beautiful sweaters out there these days, aren't there? There are just so many. Um, so we, we, uh, we have so much to choose from. It's amazing. So this was a delight to knit. It's a great design, well-written pattern. Cascade 220 is a very good workhorse yarn. Uh, it's a good price point. I think I used four and a half skeins of the Cascade 220 in this. Um, plus I used Galway Heather in a natural color here. And I think I used with the yoke plus the two sleeves. I think I used about a skein and a third. So probably about 300, 320 yards of the cream as well. So um, you know, I probably used, uh, about 900 and, about 900 and something yards of the blue, uh, to make this sweater. And it ended up big for me. So that's not a whole lot of yarn to make a sweater. Um, so I made the mistake that I had actually signed up for the smaller, a smaller size and went up a size when I started knitting it out of fear that it was going to be too small and then it ended up too big. So the smaller size would have been the right size for me. Lesson learned, next time I'll be doing the other size. So yeah, but really a lovely sweater. Congratulations to Sari. Um, and you may notice that, did I actually, oh, I did sew in the end for the bottom. Um, I've sewn in all the ends, but um, my friend is quite a bit taller than me. And that's another thing that the sleeves are a tiny bit long. Um, as well so she's taller and and broader than me and when i showed it to her uh, i said do you think you might like this sweater we were video chatting one day she said yeah and so i said okay one day when we see each other you'll try it on and i thought if i need to lengthen the body a little bit that's easy peasy i've got a skein and a half left of this yarn um i probably wouldn't need more than a partial of the half left to to make it a tiny bit longer for her but I think it'll probably fit her well in the sleeve it's, it's a little bit long for me it comes down to about there but it's very 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 pretty very very pretty I like it very very much I used uh, 4.5 millimeter needles uh, I did not go up a size on the color work uh, I as I've mentioned before, I tend to knit a little looser when I'm doing the color work because I'm so conscious of having long enough floats. Um, I have to say that I think I need to start calming down about that um, concern about my floats. Uh, I find what ends up happening is that my floats are probably not as neat on the back as they sometimes could be. I end up with some floats that are too long. Um, and it always works out. So yeah, one thing I think would probably be good practice for me would be to make socks, color work socks. I've never made um, socks that are color work or mittens. And I, I think I really should. Um, I don't always love doing color work on sleeves, but I got through this and um, I knit this on a small circumference needle and it worked quite well actually. So I thought maybe I need to practice a bit on socks, working a smaller circumference and getting used to not having the play of a longer circular needle to create the longer floats um, and just end up with sort of a natural length float and they work out fine. So I might, I might be doing that. Um, and plus I would love to have some color work socks and just become a little bit more comfortable because even though I've done a lot of practicing, I've made quite a few sweaters. I still feel like there's something that doesn't feel completely, um, comfortable for me somehow with, with color work knitting, but I still enjoy doing it and, um, yeah, have really, really enjoyed making this sweater as well as the other ones that I made this last winter. 
So that is the first FO that I have for today. All right, let's talk about the next finished object, which is the sweater that I'm wearing. I am wearing my third ranunculus sweater. I have made two others, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, I showed this to you last time. I was knitting two of them last time. I'm now only knitting one because this one is off the needles. And um, I'm really, really very, very happy with this sweater. I made this version and this pattern, the ranunculus sweater is by Midori Hirose or um, House of Midori, I think is her other uh, name as a designer. And um, this is a pattern that has been made by many, many, many. This is also a pattern where the pictures in the pattern itself uh, could be a turn off. I would never have made this pattern had I not seen so many lovely versions. And, and then I realized, oh, this looks actually really quite nice. When I first made my first, uh, my first ranunculus, when I finished it, I thought, I don't know if I'm going to wear this. And then I realized I wanted to wear it all the time because it was a wonderful layering piece. And um, so, and then I've just seen so many versions of this and there are so many nice versions of this sweater out there. Um, so it's a lovely, lovely pattern. I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, some of the modifications that I've made. Not really many. I just don't do the fancy schmancy um, cast on that they have in the pattern. I just do a regular long tail cast on and I cast on the number of stitches that they have you end up with once you've finished doing what I think is a tubular cast on. I'm not 100% sure because I've never done that kind of a cast on. I'm very lazy when it comes to my cast ons. I just always do a long tail cast on. I, I really should try these different cast ons, especially the tubular one, but I just, I don't know. I just don't. When I want to get a sweater going, I just want to get the sweater going. I'm not interested in learning a new cast on. <laughs> so, but I really should because it always looks nice. But I just did an ordinary cast on. I followed the instructions and properly for the, for the, uh, for the yoke. Um, I do the, they, they have some raglan cast ons here. This time, instead of doing, uh, they have a, uh, an I cord bind off for the sleeve. I actually did a ribbed sleeve and I did that partly because I was concerned that this sweater was going to be too tight. I actually thought this sweater was going to be small and I did purposely block it, which I don't normally do. I usually just wet my sweaters and lay them flat and let them just settle into their shape. But I was concerned when I finished knitting this that it was just a little, it was very close to my body. And I thought, well, this is very bizarre because my other two ranunculus sweaters have nice ease. One of them has a lot of ease. One of them has slightly less ease, but they both have ease. This has ended up with good ease. Um, not a huge amount, but enough that it, it, you know, it has that, that feel of a cropped sweater. And uh, I did post on Instagram, so you're welcome to go there and see my posted pictures to have a have a good look up, uh, at it. But yeah, it's just got a nice amount of ease. Um, I really like wearing it. I either wear it with a blouse underneath or I wear it with just a t-shirt, really, and have the t-shirt coming out from underneath. Um, it's just a very, very lovely, airy layering piece. Now this one looks less airy because of this unusual yarn that I used. I used Americo Brisa. Americo no longer exists, unfortunately. She stopped selling yarn, I think about almost two years ago or a year and a half ago. Um, she was out of Toronto and would get yarn milled in South America. So most of the yarn or a lot of the yarn was um, alpaca based. Uh, alpaca combinations and this one is a bamboo alpaca and it is a chainette yarn and I don't know if you can see that that you know each each stitch is a is not as crisp as you might see in another kind of yarn and it's a lovely light texture because it's it's half bamboo it's in fact I think 55% bamboo and 45% alpaca so it's very light, perfect for our coolish spring or the cooler days of our spring, because some days can be just really, really warm. Um, and it's just, it's very, very lovely. 
But this yarn, which was advertised as a fingering, I would say behaves more like a DK. Um, it, even though I knit this on six millimeter needles, you know, it is not a transparent fabric, maybe slightly, but not as much as my other two ranunculus sweaters. Um, so this is a pattern that people have used lace weight with mohair, fingering alone, fingering with mohair, sport alone, sport with mohair, DK, and I've even seen some worsted versions, although I think the worsted versions in the end don't have the lofty feeling, um, but they could just be a really nice woolly swell sweater to, you know, to wear on a cold day, but they won't have quite the airy quality that this generally has. I've seen this knit in DK in Rowan felted tweed, and it looked beautiful. Um, yeah, and I brought down my two other versions to show you just uh, quickly. So this was my very original version, and this is made out of uh, Volmice. It's been in the closet, so it's a bit it's a bit folded. Um, this was made out of Volmice lace garn, which is a, which is a, more of a light fingering than a lace weight, really, with um, fleece artist Zambezi mohair. And uh, this one, like this sweater, has some ease, not a huge amount of ease. I don't remember if I made this on five and a half or six millimeter needles, to be honest. I don't quite remember, but this was the first one that convinced me that I wanted more ranunculus sweaters in my life. The second one that I made, I made uh, with six millimeter needles for sure, and it ended up with way more ease. And, uh, but very, very, oops, sorry, let me just, and I've been wearing this a lot lately, a lot. Um, I can't, <laughs> can't get it to sit straight. Hello, I'm having some, there we go. Um, this I made out of um, Ancient Arts, I'll have to put it down here because I can't remember. It started with an R. Was it Revival? And it is a lace weight. Um, I think it's a merino silk base. And I knit this on six millimeter needles. And it was very clear that the gauge was much looser than with my first ranunculus. And it has ended up being a very, very airy sweater. Um but it is so wonderful to wear. It's as light as air, it gives slight warmth, and it it just, it falls very nicely, even though it's a lot larger. Uh, and I think it's the light airiness of it. And as you can see on this one, I did do the I-cord bind off, as well as on the original one. Um, so it's just worked out for me very well. This one, sorry, I did it with the Ancient Arts plus a mohair. What did I use? I'm not 100% sure what I used. Uh, I'll have to put that down here. It was not um, drops and it was not Rowan. It was uh, a German mohair that had a little bit of glitter in it. So I don't know. I don't know if you'll be able to see that, but it does have a tiny bit of glitter. And I have to say, this is actually probably the one that I get most compliments on, but I've gotten compliments on both of my ranunculus sweaters. Um, people just saying that looks so lovely. And I think it's just the light, airy nature of them that uh, people tend to like. So last time when I posted about the ranunculus, there was actually a lot of comments uh, down below about people having made several and wanting to make more, people never having made it, people having making one right now. And I thought maybe we need to have a ranunculus along. So I think I'm going to start a uh, Ranunculus Love Cal in the uh, Ravelry group, but also use that hashtag if you want to participate on Instagram, Ranunculus Love Cal, and this will just be an informal knit along. You can come into the group ask questions if you're worried about something about the pattern, show what you're doing, show your, your finished ranunculus, maybe show the seven others that you've already made, uh, whatever. It's just going to be an informal one that we can just, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean there could be prizes at the end. I'll see. There's no end date. We'll just keep on going and, and talk about ranunculus for a little while longer. 
So if you are in the mood to participate, uh, head on over to Ravelry or Instagram to participate in that knit along. And um, what, what what else was I going to tell you about that? I think that's it. <laughs> I think that's it. So yeah, I'll just go ahead and I, I, well, by the time this airs, I will have created a group, and uh, we can we can chat about ranunculus. Uh, people often have questions about this sweater, so you can ask your question. I'll answer. Somebody else perhaps will step in and answer. Uh, please feel free to step in and answer if you've got uh, the answer or if there are varying answers, feel free to, to step in and, and answer. And we can, we can uh, knit our ranunculuses together or ranunculi together and, um, and just share them. And hopefully this will encourage some of you who have been a little bit nervous about knitting it because it really isn't a particularly difficult sweater. As long as you're okay with it being you know, a loose sweater. Um, and I think that the outcome really depends on the yarn that you use. And I think it particularly depends on the base yarn that you use. If you're using uh, mohair with something else, I think that the other yarn, the fingering weight, let's say that you're using with it is really going to dictate. I think that's why in my gray one, the silk content had an impact on it becoming a, a looser sweater. Whereas in this one, the 100% merino, I think somehow kept it together a little bit more. It's also quite a tightly spun merino. So, you know, you could end up with a different outcome. I think this is a sweater that is so relaxed. I think it doesn't have to be just perfect. Um, you can just make it and just let it be what it's going to be. All right, let's move on. So my first, whoops. I've got a bit of a mess here beside me. You can't see that. That's okay. My first work in progress is going to be on the same vein, uh, the ranunculus vein, or in the same vein, I should say. Uh, it is <laughs> my olive green version, which I have to say is almost finished. I finished the first sleeve. I am just about to finish the second sleeve. This one is my olive green version, which is going to be a much woollier version than this one, which is so light and airy um, and uh, bouncy, which the yarn was, the chain knit yarn was so bouncy. Um, this one I think is going to be warmer. It's being made with one strand of Isiger mohair in this olive green color and the other strand do i have the band i don't think i do is by amelia and philomene in uh, their josephine base and the josephine base is a non superwash merino i believe um and so it's a more woolly wool so i think that this sweater is going to be a little bit more of a warmer cozier version as a result of the non superwash nature of this this wool um, it, it feels thicker and woollier somehow. Um, and yeah, it's, it's coming along beautifully. One thing I have to say I usually do is I finish one sleeve where I think I might want it. And the, the way I want it at this point, I thought, do I do ribbing or do I do the I cord on this one? Um, and then while I'm working the other one, I try it on and I see, do I really like that? Sometimes I try a second length with the second sleeve and if I like that more I just go and adjust the first one um, and then end up with what I think I want. So this will be finished next time and it's going to be hopefully finished tonight. We'll see if I end up having to adjust the sleeves and uh, and then this will be ranunculus number four and probably not really worn until the fall because I think uh, maybe if we have a really cool day I'll wear it but otherwise this might end up being something that I'll be saving until the fall. I have a friend who's in love with my ranunculus sweaters and I'm thinking about making her one as well so that could end up being one that gets cast on um, in the next little while and, and working on that. Her birthday's coming up. I don't think I'd have it in time for her birthday but um, it might be a, bil a bit of a a belated birthday present for her. My other work in progress is the Dreaming of Spring Socks. I have finished the first one. 
This is a pattern by This Handmade Life, also known as Olivia Villarreal. Um, I've spoken to you about her over the last couple of episodes. And this is one of her more recent patterns that I cast on and have really enjoyed knitting. It's just a very nice feather and fan pattern. And I think I'm actually starting to enjoy knitting socks top down. Um, and I'm thinking that I'm going to practice a little more with my next pair and do another pair of top down socks just to continue to get the hang of doing the heel, which I suggested to you last time was causing me a little bit of angst just because I hadn't done one in so long. And also getting the length of the sock right. I had bought a sock ruler uh, and I what I did was I used the sock ruler to compare my other socks and when I should start the toe. Because in the past I've had a hard time getting the toe in the right place and sometimes ending up with longer socks. I had told you last time that I hadn't made a bottom or a top down sock in at least a decade and that wasn't true. I had made a pair uh, last summer or the summer, last summer I think I tested uh, a pattern for Tracy Miller of the Grocery Girls, her Georgia socks and um they my first pair ended up too long for me um, because i had a hard time gauging where to put the toe with the sock ruler that i had bought last time or a couple of episodes ago i showed it to you um, i was able to measure the distance between uh you know the gusset and where the toe started and i ended up getting it right and these socks fit beautifully this yarn is uh, the Natural Sock Base by Woolly Mammoth Yarns. My friend Kate had uh, gifted this to me when she visited, I think the first time. And so I have used this yarn. This is the Jasmine Base, which is this very, very light, uh, very, very light pink. And uh, this was an interesting yarn to work with. I'm curious to see how this wears. I, I'm gonna be honest, I'm a little nervous about how this is going to wear. But I'm, I'm curious to give this a try. And now that I have some mending skills, if they need to be mended, they'll be mended. But um, yeah, really, really lovely. I'm, I'm working on the second sock at the moment, which is being housed in this wonderful bag that my friend Kate had made for me. And all of us actually who were at the retreat with her and Emma of Woolly Mammoth Fibers in November of 2019. And I'm just on the second second sock and I have this cute little progress keeper here. Well, not progress keeper, but more than anything, just to show me that this is the right size. This cute little mushroom, yeah, is that focused? Mushroom progress keeper from Whimsy and Sassy on Etsy. She is a Canadian progress keeper and stitch marker maker. So I'm just at the point where I have to start the heel um, so I'll be doing that. I've been working quite furiously on the ranunculus, wanting to get that uh, second ranunculus done so that then I feel I can start another sweater. So, yeah, so those are really the two works in progress that I have left. Um, I had had a question in the, uh, the, the comments down below, I believe, on YouTube. Somebody asking how many skeins is a sweater quantity. Um, and that's an interesting question. I think it depends a little bit on your size. I know that I tend to use about a thousand yards of yarn per sweater. And that's for a sweater that is normal sized, not something that's really long or um, something with cables, which will require more yarn. Just a plain sweater. As I said, um, this one in the blue cascade, I used about, I'm gonna say 950 yards of the blue, and then another 300 yards of this. If I had not used any color work, if this had just been like a plain sweater, I'm gonna say I probably would have used about 1,050 yards to make this. Let's say 1,100. So I usually make sure I have about 1,100 yards of yarn for me to make a regular sweater. This sweater, the ranunculus, both of my, all, all of my versions have used about 750 yards of 
the two yarns or the yarn that I'm using. So this used about just, I had a little nugget left from the second skein, two skeins of this yarn, uh, which was less than 400 yards. So it was about 350. So I used about 700 yards on this and the other two ranunculus as well. But I would say that most sweaters that I that I make are probably about um, about 1100, let's say. And I am somebody with a 41 size bust. Um, I'm not tall. I'm only 5'3". Uh, what's that? 163 or 164 centimeters, something like that. I'm not a tall person. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm kind of a medium large build. So uh, I wear about a size 10, sometimes 12, somewhere in there. So, and I use about 1100 yards of yarn. So when I see yarn, I just naturally buy whatever is closest to that. Sometimes it ends up, well, usually it ends up being a little bit more than that, especially if you buy three skeins of fingering, you're probably gonna end up with about 1200, 1250 yards. And um, three skeins of fingering will make a sweater for me, unless it's going to be a longer sweater or have like a big collar or have cables. Cables seem to take up more yarn because you need kind of more fabric to to when you include the cables. So that was an interesting question in terms of, you know, how much should you buy? Obviously, if you are a very small person, you probably need less. Um, and buying a thousand yards of yarn is probably more than you really need. If you're a larger person, you might want to add one or two hundred yards um, and and so forth. So it's, it's, and if you're a tall person, of course, that will have an impact as well if you need more for the sleeves and more for the torso. So just wanted to answer that question. So I decided that I wanted to share some old socks with you. And um, I had planned to actually wash a couple of the pairs and then realize this morning that I had not. Um, and as I said, my life's been a little bit crazy, so I missed that little detail. So I'm going to be showing you a couple of pair of old and dirty socks. I hope that's okay. Anyway, feel free to look away. Um, so why did I decide to do this? Part of the reason is because I think it's always interesting. Um, and what started this whole conversation was this particular pair of socks. I made these socks in 2015. So six years ago. The yarn uh, is uh, Night Owl Fibers. And at the time, Rachel was a very young lady. Uh, I think, in fact, she was a teenager and she started this uh, striped yarn dyeing business. And this was her colorway, one of her first colorways called Sherlock Holmes. And I bought a skein of yarn from her and um, made these socks. Now in 2015, I didn't have that many socks. So my socks got worn a lot, right? The more socks you have, the less often you're wearing them and the longer they'll last. But at the time, I think I had three pairs of socks um, and uh, one of them felted uh, and I didn't wear it very much. And, and, and actually, I didn't even think I would talk about those ones because they're actually a dyer that no longer makes yarn. Um, it was, um, Les Femmes Yarns, I think her name was, but, um, I was very disappointed with those socks because they were supposed to be super wash. I had made a very intricate lace pattern and they felted and the lace pattern just kind of went and got lost. That's the only time that's ever happened. I always wash my socks in the washing machine on the delicate cycle. Just so you know, I tend to accumulate them and I do a delicate wash. Um, so these have always been through the washer. So I put these on recently and I realized I've worn these socks a lot and they are now starting to wear in the heel six years later. I don't even know if I have any cotton socks that I've bought at the store that have lasted that long. Um, they are starting to fray a little bit on the heel, but nothing on the bottom, although that for me is not an area where I tend to use my socks up. My socks tend to get used up in the heel primarily. 
but only now, six years later, and even though I have a lot of socks, I really like these socks a lot. So um, these are a merino nylon sock. I think they were 75, 25, if I remember, or 80, 20. Um, they have a good twist on the yarn, uh, but it, I wouldn't call this a bouncy yarn. You know, some yarns are really twisted and they end up being quite a bouncy yarn. This is not one of them. Um, and so I actually wrote to Rachel, who is still dyeing yarn, Night Owl Fibers, and she always does self-striping and her self-striping yarns are absolutely fabulous. And I just wrote to her and I said, I just want you to know that your socks have lasted so incredibly well. Are you still using the same base? And she wrote back, of course, happy that somebody had said that her socks have lasted so long and said that she's in fact not using this base anymore, but that she has another base. And she has sent me her base, uh, her new base. Uh, this is a 7525 Superwash Merino. And this is the Life and Death Brigade. So uh, it is based on the Gilmore Girls. And this is a self-striping yarn that's got uh, blue and purple, gray, green, brown. Um, and she let me choose from her selection on her shop or in her shop. She's got an amazing selection of yarn, by the way, uh, all based on things like the Gilmore Girls, Harry Potter, Friends, um, different fairy tales and lots of fabulous color combinations. This was the one that I fell in love with, although I have to say I've never actually watched the Gilmore Girls, but I feel like I, I probably should start watching the Gilmore Girls when I'm knitting with these, with this, which is going to be next. Once I have finished the uh, Dreaming of Spring socks, I'm going to cast these socks on. I'm really curious to see what it's like. Um, it's got a wonderful twist. So anyway, if you're in, in the mood to check out Night Owl Fibers, uh, she does beautiful work. But, and I really was so touched that she sent this to me. That's not at all why I wrote her. I just wanted her to know that I was really impressed with her yarn. Um, and I know that, you know, she's been going along for, for the last six years, if not seven years, making beautiful yarn. And so this made me really start thinking about the yarns that I have used in my socks and wanting to share about that and some of the things that I have learned. So um, a couple of things that I've learned. Uh, generally, I prefer 60 to 64 stitch count. That's for me particularly. I know that my the area where I tend to wear my socks the most is in the heel. And on this heel, I had used the basic gusset heel by Wendy D. Johnson. So unlike a heel flap, there is a little bit less fabric there. So that's another reason that I've started thinking, I had already put this away, I took a little break, um, that heel flaps may be more long wearing for me because if you do a slip stitch heel, a slip stitch portion here, or the partridge heel, you're ending up with a little bit more fabric, so it might actually last longer. Um, that's my thinking there. And um, one other thing I've come to realize is that uh, having lace near the heel where the heel is rubbing against the shoe is not great. So generally, if I have a pair of lace socks that I'm making, I am likely to not start the lace all the way around the foot after the heel if I'm going toe up um, right away and continue in stocking it for a little while. So here is another pair of, of socks that I made and I made a long time ago and they're wearing really, really well. This unfortunately is a dyer that is no longer dyeing. This is Bittersweet Woolery and this was a BFL base and this is the Nutkin sock pattern which is really lovely except that it twists like it's really hard like when I put it on my foot um, it twists a lot but I started the heel ends here and I actually knit a little bit more um, because I was concerned about my heel and the end of my shoe hitting this portion here so that's just something that I've done because I had a pair of socks where the lace started quite low and they just completely 
just got destroyed. Um, I threw them out. I don't even remember what they were. Um, I don't remember what the yarn was. Uh, I don't remember what the yarn was, I'm afraid. But because um, I didn't actually make them, um, a friend made them for me and uh, I had given her the yarn. So I realized then that having lace like right around here where the shoe is hitting is probably not a good idea. But these are another pair of socks uh, that I made. When did I make these? I don't know, 2015 or 2016. Um, <clears throat> another yarn, and this is one of my dirty socks, I'm sorry. Another yarn that has been quite in, uh, impressive to me uh, is by, as you can see, like they're totally stretched out. I'm so sorry. This is a yarn by um, Samantha in Montreal, Scrumptious Pearl. And she uses quite a squishy base. Um, and uh, here's another one where I started the lace a little bit higher up. Although I think I could have started up even a, a little higher. Um, and this is a base that has worn really well. And Samantha is another one of these people who does a um, self-striping yarn in beautiful, beautiful colors. Um, and it has lasted quite well. This one was a, an afterthought heel, um, which I don't enjoy doing, but I did because I wanted to keep the stripes intact. So a really nice, she has a very nice base and it has been quite long lasting. Another pair that I made, um, I'm realizing a couple of things here. First of all, some of these dyers are no longer dying. The other thing I've come to realize is that I have kept very few, in fact, I've kept no commercial sock yarns for myself for the most part. Um, generally, when I've made socks for other people, I have used commercial yarns thinking, well, under the premise that they're more likely to last longer, um, perhaps they're a little bit more predictable. Whereas when I've bought yarn from a yarn dyer and it's my first time, I don't really know how their yarns are going to, how their yarns are going to wear. So giving those to somebody who's getting one pair of wool socks may not be the best idea. So my friends have usually gotten the more commercial yarns. This is yarn by Fondant Fiber, who is no longer uh, dying, but this is yarn that hasn't kept up particularly well because um, I haven't worn these that much. Now, I know that this yarn was a mix of British yarns. Um, I really loved working with it, but it has also felted just a tiny little bit. Um, but it's one that, that I haven't worn as much. And I have to say that the sock itself has worn quite a bit there. And I'm in the process this was one of the darning projects that I had where I realized I needed a little bit more practice with um, duplicate stitching before I really take on this sock. So I haven't worn them in the sense this winter because I've been waiting for that to happen. But um, yeah, one sock yarn, and this is another one of my dirty pairs, I'm afraid, and really quite dirty. One sock yarn that is a, an indie dyer and that is very, very well known um, that has actually impressed me is Hedgehog Fibers. Um, this is a sock that I made in 2016, so five years ago. Um, I don't remember what colorway this was, but this was, and this is a 90 merino and 10% nylon, so it has a little bit less nylon in it and it's actually held up quite well um there is a tiny little bit of thinning happening at the bottom of the heel there but um and i made the fine and dandy socks these were really fun to make actually i made two pairs of these i made a pair for a friend of mine as well as for me uh, the fine and dandy is by jessica gore and uh, it was a very fun pattern to make and i i would make it again um, but yeah, I have to say I've been quite impressed with uh, this yarn from Hedgehog Fibers. Uh, you know, the, the heel has kept up quite well. Um, and it's not a yarn that I've bought a lot of. In fact, I think I got this uh, in a trade. Um, and uh, yeah, but it's, it's actually kept up quite well, I have to say. And it just seems like this is the area for me that 
tends to get worn out. I know the bottom of the foot is the area for some other people that uh, that tends to, to wear out. I have one more pair, and I'm um, sorry, I'm realizing that a lot of these dyers aren't even dying anymore because I don't think that Pirate's Yarns is dying anymore. We'd have to look. She is based out, out west. I made this during our road trip to PEI, this pair of socks. Out of her yarn, I did just a plain vanilla sock. This was called Pirates Love Rainbows. And uh, this has actually been an impressive base as well because these socks I've worn a lot because again, they're also only 60 stitches and so they hug my foot. Um, so they're just really nice to wear under boots or little booties because they don't take up as much space. And uh, this is a 75-25, and I made these, yeah, in 2016 on our road trip to PEI. Uh, I, again, did the basic gusset heel, and um, it is a yarn that has, has kept up well. So one thing I feel like I need to do is definitely um, make some some yarns or some socks with commercial yarns. I did this year, I did some West Yorkshire spinner yarn uh, so socks. So I'm curious to see how those wear. And um, I, I already mentioned to you the um, hyena and petticoats. Sorry, that's what the name, brand name was that just felt it on me. Another couple of pairs of socks that I no longer have because they fell apart uh, was one by Lorna's Laces in her shepherd multi sock um they really just fell apart on me and at the time i had no darning skills and i just chucked them i didn't really like them to begin with and um the yarn really didn't hold up for me at least and i remember it um tore apart on the, the heel and the bottom of the foot which is a place where i don't normally wear my socks that much and another pair that uh, completely fell apart was using a yarn by Julie Slain. However, I'm going to say, a, I'm going to put a caveat there because I'm not 100% sure that it's really the yarn's fault. It's in her um, Lezu fingering, which is 90% merino and 10% silk. And silk is often, not often, it is sometimes used in uh, sock yarn because silk can be strong as can be mohair. And I had two pairs of socks uh, made out of one skein, one for Isla, which Isla outgrew very quickly, and then another pair for myself. And one day Isla was going out on an excursion, and so I let them have uh, my Lezu fingering socks. And the socks came home completely destroyed. So I have no idea what Isla did. I have no idea what those kids were doing in the forest because they went on some sort of forest walk. But I, uh, I, Isla came home and I was like, what happened here? <laughs> and there was no explanation offered. So um, they just got destroyed. Uh, and I, they were fine before she took them. Uh, so, um, yeah, I don't know what happened there. <clears throat> I do have another skein of the Lazy Fingering and so I'm kind of feeling like I should make a pair of socks with those and see what happens with them. Um, so yeah, I find kids can be really, really hard on socks. So perhaps a merino silk base is not something for, uh, I don't know how old Isla was at that time, 10 or something like that. Maybe not for a 10 year old. I don't know. Um, so yeah, so those are some of my, my old socks that I thought I would share with you. Um, Oh, and one thing else, I have some little notes here. Uh, one thing I've realized as well is that socks with cables tend to be quite tight. So these, um, these socks by fondant fiber, these are all little cables. And I have another pair upstairs that are newer, so I wasn't gonna show them to you, uh, that also have cables. Uh, all around and that kind of a stitch pattern and that makes the socks a lot tighter um, and I have found that they can tend to be a little bit harder to get on the foot and tend to have a little bit less give than something else whereas of course um, a stitch pattern like this and this I didn't tell you is the groovy sock which no longer 
exists is a no longer published pattern for some reason but I happen to have it um, so of course a lace sock is going to have a little bit more a little bit more give but I found the socks where I have cables to be harder to get on my foot the nutkin which is actually kind of a cable like sock a bit has like it's it's got a very skinny ankle and I have a hard time getting these socks on of course once they're on they stay on <laughs> so yeah so there you go I hope that that was interesting um, I do regret that I don't have that many commercial sock yarns to to share about uh, so I'm gonna have to make that a goal so perhaps that'll be the next sock share at some point in the future before heading out, I just thought I would share a couple of beautiful things that have come my way. First, I wanted to share uh, a package that came from my friend Kate of the Hawthorne Cottage Craft Podcast. She has sent a bag for me and a bag for the podcast. So thank you so much, Kate. Now, my biggest problem is that I cannot decide which one of these bags I would want to keep and which one of these bags I would want to give away because I actually love both of them this one is absolutely stunning with these bees on them and then this one is just I, I actually really like this fabric and actually she bought this fabric here in ottawa so that's also kind of special which makes it makes me think that perhaps that would be special as the giveaway but anyway her bags are so beautifully made kate used to make bags and have a shop she no longer does but she does occasionally make bags as she did for the olin retreat that I was on with her and Emma and a whole bunch of other wonderful people. Hello, wonderful people, if you're watching. But Kate is a, a really wonderful bag maker. Um, so these are both beautifully made and one of these will end up as a prize. Um, Kate as well sent me some stunning yarn, oops, which has gone flying. If you happen to watch Kate's podcast, the Hawthorne Cottage Craft, you'll know that she recently has made a Felix sweater as well as a Felix cardigan out of yarn by Adele McBride. There is her, her, her label. And Kate had actually made uh, her Felix cardigan out of a sort of an emerald green out of this base, which is the Momer base, which is a... Uh, 30% mohair and 70% merino. And so Kate has sent me some in this fabulous purple color. The only thing I don't know is what I'm going to make with this. It's about 330 yards. So I have to figure out what I would make with 330 yards. This is going to be a creative endeavor in trying to decide what I'll do with that. So thank you so much, Kate. In the package with some chocolate, the chocolate's gone, and um, some little buttons, or pins rather. So I have to actually get those onto a bag. Speaking of bag, I also bought a bag from Harriet, who uh, has just opened a, a website. She was, I think, selling her bags kind of through direct messages and now has a website and her bags are called oh dear what was it now wild wild i'm gonna have to put it down here i think it's wild in the woods um i'm gonna put her shop down here <clears throat> she makes beautiful bags using harris tweed as well as uh just stunning nature inspired fabrics and so I had to partake. Uh, I had seen this bag on Kate's uh, podcast and so fell in love with it, got in touch with Harriet and said, can I have one too? So yeah, um, it is a smaller bag. Uh, I was actually thinking that I'd gotten a larger bag. Um, so this will probably end up being used for a small shawl or socks. Um, yeah, it's, it's really beautiful and very beautifully made as well. Um, just beautiful and she has just lovely details like this wood here and I only just noticed that she's actually got the Harris tweed tag on the inside 
So beautiful bags that have come my way. Um, something else that I wanted to share with you was I got myself the newest issue of the Making Stories. I've never bought Making Stories before. I've never felt compelled to buy it, honestly, but this edition is so beautiful. And it was principally this cardigan, the Bindweed cardigan that I needed to have in my life. So I've actually, I started swatching but I've realized that my yarn is not quite the most appropriate yarn for it. So I've bought some yarn that when it arrives, I'm going to be casting this on because I cannot stop thinking about this beautiful, beautiful cardigan. It's just stunning. This version is made with um, Knitting for Olive, their Merino base, plus the mohair. I started swatching with my Alley Cat yarns. You may recall, Sorry, I've got a bit of a mess here. You may recall I showed you last time my Alley Cat yarns in this stunning color. And I got some Knitting for Olive mohair that goes beautifully with it. And I started swatching with it. And it's beautiful, but it's a little bit dense of fabric, I realize, for that particular cardigan. The Knitting for Olives is a lighter merino. Um, I would say that that the, the Leo base by Alley Cat Yarns, which is a BFL nylon base, it's a, it's a good sort of solid fingering weight. And I think I need something a little lighter for that cardigan because the cardigan's got such a light feel to it. I think it would be a little dense with this combination. So I ended up ordering some Knitting for Olive to make the cardigan because I wanted, I, I realized I don't have, I don't think I have anything else that would really work um, at that time, at this time. Um, so when it arrives, I'll be casting the bindweed on, but there are really uh, very, very beautiful sweaters in this, in this particular edition. There is this gorgeous DK weight sweater that has this wonderful element on the sleeves um there are mohair sweaters there's uh here's that dk sweater from the front um so many beautiful beautiful things but then there's this sweater omg this sweater <laughs> it's just like yeah this is a beautiful addition really beautiful and I also got the most recent making. I think I have just about every single one of these. I really, really enjoy the making magazines for all the beautiful projects, not only knitting that they have in here. This one also has really lovely, lovely patterns in it uh, in terms of uh, knitting because there's also sewing in here. But there's this pattern here, which is a three color sweater very simple, that's very lovely. Um, there's this shawl that I find really intriguing. This normally would not be up my alley, but there's something about this that I just really, really like. Um, uh, beautiful cardigans, beautiful socks. Also, as always, really, the Making Magazine is, is always uh, a delight. And I actually lent these to another friend of mine who a, a bunch of them I said here look through these uh, who's not a knitter but she does do some sewing and she was like these are so beautiful I was like they really are so uh if you you know if you if somebody's not necessarily a knitter there's so many lovely sewing projects and quilting projects and needle projects whether it's uh, embroidery or needle felting there's lots of different things every time it's it's very very interesting And a couple of other things I wanted to share with you. <clears throat> a podcast that I watch is uh, Nikki from Knitting with Cat Hair. Nikki is in Northern Ontario. Would you say that's Northern Ontario, Nikki? And um, I just really enjoy Nikki's podcast, low key. She's just really lovely. And somehow Nikki seems to enable me. Um, I ended up buying the um, 
Georgian Bay yarns a few months back and that was because of her and this time I ended up buying yarn from the Small Bird Workshop which is located in um, BC and uh, the yarn is milled in Italy but dyed in BC and this is a 50% linen 30% cotton and 20% bamboo lace weight <clears throat> excuse me and I ended up buying this in these two colors and I got two skeins of each. It's a lace weight and there are 660 meters in each. I ended up having a bit of a snafu with my winder because this had some weirdness to it. And uh, linen type yarns are not the easiest to wind. If there's any sort of kinks in there, it's going to cause problems. So I ended up winding it by hand, started it on the winder and then finished it by hand. So I decided to try swatching these yarns together to see what would happen when I put them together. I have no idea what's going to happen with these yet. But <clears throat> if you know me, I'm a sucker for linen. Linen and mohair. I really should put them together, shouldn't I? Um, so I've got two skeins of the paler pink and two skeins of this bright sort of salmony orangey color. And uh, I don't know if I'll color block them or if I will mix them together. But we'll see what this becomes. But thank you for enabling me, Nikki. Um, yeah, so that's another thing that came into my life. And then in terms of yarn, I got a bunch of Nutiden yarn. If you know about Nutiden yarn, this is unspun yarn, kind of like Flotulopi, that comes from Sweden, from a small company called Honer och Eir, something like that. Um, and the yarn itself is called Nutiden. And she does about four or five updates a year. And they're essentially always one of a kind. Um, her yarns go quickly, and this time I was able to to grab some. So I ended up getting three cakes of this beautiful brown, which is just lovely, called Trofast, which I think has something to do with truffle, probably. And I ended up getting two cakes of this beautiful pink, pinky orangey color. It's coming across more orange in the picture than it is in real life. And I actually got some mohair and I'm going to be stranding this with mohair to make some sort of a vest. That's my thinking at this point. This is going to become some sort of a sweater. Maybe this should be my <laughs> in my Princess Leia look. Um, and I also got one cake of this other yarn. I don't remember what this one was called. This one was called Sinna. Um, not sure what this one was called but it's a beautiful oatmeal that's got like reds going through it. And then this beautiful little pink co color. So these might end up going with the brown in a color work. I'm not 100% sure. This is very, very unusual yarn. I do think that it is, um, well, if you've worked with Plotulopi, you know what it's like to work with um, basically unspun yarn. And I think this may be a little bit more delicate than Plotulopi. Um, so a lot of people are either stranding it with another yarn, often mohair, or double stranding it with itself. Um, and that will make for a stronger yarn to work with. So I haven't started swatching with this yet or playing around with it. Um, I'm very, very excited to try that. Uh, we'll see when that starts happening. In the package, they also sent along a couple of little bits. They tend to do that when you get a package from them. So I, I ended up uh, getting two bits like this that are, I think this is a new one that's actually coming out. So they were already starting to experiment with that. This is a special edition yarn they did. And I think this must be an older yarn in here along with probably um, another brown, not the one that I got, a deeper brown that they had before. 
So that's kind of fun. You get you get to, to experiment with other colors. This could easily go into color work as well. We'll see. We'll see what ends up happening with these. Um, but I was just very excited to have these and to give them a try. So that is something else that has come into my life. And the last thing I'm going to share with you is the lovely, lovely gift that was sent to me. <clears throat> last time I podcasted, I talked to you guys about um, my knitting ring. You may recall it's the knitting ring that I use to um, do color work. And I got it from Finland from a woman named Sani Lehtinen. But I had done some sort of research when I checked out the hashtag on Instagram, knitting ring, um, and found this other person. And I know at least one person who's bought a ring from her. And I spoke about her on my last podcast. Her name was Corinne. Well, the shop is called Corina Lunita. The dyer's name is Karina. And um, she found out that I mentioned her. I'm not even 100% sure how she found that out. And contacted me and said, thank you so much for uh, mentioning my shop. It seemed to have generated some business for her. And so she sent me a knitting ring. And it arrived this week. And I am very, very excited about this. So I think the next time I knit a color work, because I'm going to take a tiny break from color work right now, I'll definitely be using this. It is so beautiful. So this is a ring for three colors because the, the yarn would go between these loops. Um, and I don't know if you can, is it going to, is it going to, is it going to focus there? She just made a beautiful, beautiful ring. The ring is open there, so it's a little bit adjustable. I got the medium for three color knitting, just in case I have those three color moments. <laughs> but um, uh, it's just so lovely. And I have to say that when I saw it in the picture, it seemed uh, like I just love the whimsical design of them. Um, I was not expecting it to be as sturdy as it is. It's a really, really very well-made ring. So uh, if you are in looking for one, um, she was based in Mexico, but has now moved back to the States and uh, is out of one of the W states. Can't remember if it was Wisconsin or Washington state. Um, she's there and making her rings there. She's got a lot of stunning jewelry. So if you happen to be if you happen to have a weak spot for jewelry, be careful. Um, but she also has these knitting rings and I think has made uh, quite a few. So I know some of you have bought these and I'm, I'll be very curious to, to find out about uh, your experience with um, Karina's ring or if you got the Sunny ring. Um, I know some a couple of people did. So I'll be curious to hear about your experience with those as well. <clears throat> Hers also came with a lovely cleaning a pad and a little pouch, which I think I will use for my two rings. I think they will go in here together because they're both highly valued by me. <laughs> I love my knitting rings. So I think, I think that's all that I had to share with you. I feel like that was a lot. So hopefully I have no idea how long this is going to be because I tend to film it in segments. But hopefully it was interesting to you. And um, um, yeah, so that's what I've been making. That's what are the beautiful things that have come into my life. And um, yeah, and as I said, life's been kind of a little weird for me lately uh, with just being at hospitals, doing a lot of phone calls, um, trying to work in between, getting some knitting done, quiet time. And uh, I've watched some <clears throat> some interesting things. Um, I'm actually in the middle of watching. Actually, I'm almost at the end of watching the series called My Brilliant Friend. You may recall, may, if you've been around for a while, last year I read the book uh, My Brilliant Friend by Elena Ferrante, and I really didn't like it very much. Um, I just had a hard time really understanding the relationships in it. Um, it was interesting from the point of view of setting the scene in 
Naples in the 1950s and the undercurrent of the mafia and the poverty and the gender relationships. But I really, I think it was poorly translated for one thing. I just really had a hard time enjoying it. But I am very much enjoying the series. It's just season one. I don't know if there is a season two in season three. And season one is based on the first book, which is the book that I read. And it is very well done. I'd almost say that it's better than the book, since I didn't enjoy the book that much. But they really did a beautiful job of conveying the time. And um, it's just, it's very, very well done. It's very subtle. It's beautifully filmed. Um, the actors are very good. And I really have really enjoyed it. I'll be sad when it's over. So that's one to watch for. Um, I ended up getting it from the library as a hard copy DVD. I don't know if it's online somewhere, but I've really enjoyed that. I've also started watching Peaky Blinders um, uh, on my son's recommendation. In fact, he'd already watched it. He said, Mom, it's violent. There's lots of sex. I'm like, I think I can handle that. <laughs> so we've been, I've been watching that with him. Um, and... Uh, uh, I was reading in Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil, you may remember, which is by uh, Barrent, John Barrent. It was written in the 80s and turned into a movie. I got to be honest, I had to stop listening to it. I just, it was a little bit meandering a little bit too much through the social lights of Savannah, Georgia. I just, it just, I was kind of like, can we just get on with it? And when we finally did get on with it, I realized I'm just not invested in this. And um, usually books make me want to go out and walk. And I just, I'd forget about it for days. I'd listen to something else. And I realized if that's happening, I'm just really not, just really not into it. So I haven't finished it. I think and that's the first time I've done that. Um, I think I might watch the movie again. Um, just to see what happens at the end, because I don't remember. <laughs> and I didn't finish the book. And um, I have not started anything else yet. Um, my reading has been slowed down. Um, just also with what's been going on, I haven't had the time to go out for walks as much. So I haven't been listening to books as much. Um, so yeah, and I thought if I'm going to listen to something, I want to listen to something that grips me um, so that I'm taken off to another place and not something that kind of I keep thinking, can you just get on with it? Um, the, the characterizations were wonderful. It's really well written. I just couldn't get into it and it could just be not the right time for me. I don't know. And uh, I think that's really about it. Uh, I finished watching Schitt's Creek which I really enjoyed in the end. It took me a while to get into that one. Uh, it wasn't an instant love, but I really enjoyed it in the end. And uh, and we are watching the last season of Kim's Convenience, which is another Canadian show that I really adore uh, about this Korean family uh, owning a um, corner store in Toronto. And uh yeah, so that's kind of the, the other sort of light, fun stuff. Uh, we've been doing some nice walks. I took the kids to uh, Omega Park, which is a sort of outdoor drive-through zoo that has native animals to, to this climate. So there are uh, bison and deer, wild boars, um, wild turkeys and moose and bears and things like that. Not all their animals run free. Some are in large, large outdoor sort of uh, pens. Um, and some of them just walk around free, such as the turkeys and the wild boars and the deer and the bison, actually. So that was fun. Um, and, uh, you know, it's been just lovely walking around. My mother is in rehab in the very center of the city. So I did take a little bit of time yesterday when it was gorgeous to walk around. So um, I've shared some of that with you as well. And uh, yeah, so it's just been kind of simple, um, just getting through all of this and also finding moments of just enjoying. We went out to the forest as well yesterday and, uh, you know, enjoying some good TV when I can and um, taking it easy. And I think that's about what's been going on around here. So 
I'll leave you with that. And hopefully this hasn't ended up too long. And uh, I'll see you next time, hopefully in the next three weeks or so. Take care, friends. Bye-bye.